All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, yeah, this was pretty sad to hear. And thanks, Brewster and all the archive for your fantastic work. And I think we can all step up and help. Uh, so please let us know how we can do that uh, once you guys have figured it out. Um, all right, um, now we're moving on to a different topic here. We're going to be discussing ownership in a digital world. Um, and I think it's a really interesting uh, topic, not only because of, you know, like different digital artifacts, NFTs and so forth that we've all like known to bits and pieces now for the past few years, but also because generative AI is now, uh, I think, really coming into the midst of it. So I'm really, really looking forward uh, to be discussing this with such a wonderful wonderful, wonderful panel. We have Marta here, uh, Jason, Catherine, uh, and Barry. And I think they're all bringing a really interesting perspective to it. But I think you should in perhaps introduce yourself briefly. And I, I would love it if you could do that in the relationship really to your definition of really what is digital ownership? What does it mean to you? What do you think, um, what do you think of uh, when you think about digital ownership? Do you want to kick us off, Marta? Sure. Um, I'll be super brief. I'm Marta Belcher. I am the president and chair of the Filecoin Foundation uh, and the general counsel and head of policy at Protocol Labs. Uh, former intellectual property lawyer and really looking at these um, through the lens of IP law, but also through the lens of uh, preserving humanity's most important information. Hey, uh, I'm Jason uh, Kwan. I am the general counsel of OpenAI. Um, I've been there for about two years. Before that, I you know, was involved at Y Combinator and a bunch of startups. And uh, before my career as a lawyer, I used to be a developer. Uh, when I think about digital ownership, I just think about the ways in which more knowledge can make its way into all the systems of learning that we have, including machine learning, and figuring out how that will ultimately end up continuing to advance the science and the arts and uh, progress. Thanks, Jason. Um, my name is Catherine Styler. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Creative Commons. And I guess for me, digital ownership, a bit like what Jason's been saying and Marta, but for me, it's about how do we build a commons of learning, of knowledge, of that no knowledge comes out of nowhere. All knowledge is built on knowledge, all creativity is based on, is built on other creativity. And I think that, you know, if we really want a commons of learning and knowledge, it's something, and Brewster touched a little bit on that, we have to defend it, we have to build on it, and we have to think about what it means to each one of us. Oh, you got your <laughs> I got one. Um, hi, my name is Barry Thru. Uh, I am the executive and artistic director of an organization called Gray Area. Um, we're a 15-year-old organization in San Francisco, and we do art and technology um, aligned towards and applied towards social impact. Um, and so we do a lot of events and education and research activities around um, cultivating communities of practice of interdisciplinary uh, creators uh, for the purposes of uh, synthesizing insights across knowledge domains. Um, um, and being community driven, I would say, our, particularly in the digital, um, whatever, paradigm, I don't, wrong word, um, uh, ownership is really a verb. Um, and so that means that ownership isn't just something you hold on to, you know, possess and hold on to, but you're really talking about a set of uh, affordances and rights and responsibilities around the data that you have. Um, and so there's a set of not just financial, but other sorts of social and transactional relationships uh, that mean that this data um, has a context in life beyond just you know a person. And so that's kind of what we're talking about. Thank you. I absolutely love the gray area. Who here has been to the gray area already? It's really wonderful. And I think I especially love that you really mix the physical with the digital there. It's like, you know, it's kind of like this uh, definitely spectrum that you can experience there. So very, very cool. Um, OK, maybe uh, we'll start off with just um, like a little bit like teasing out like the real differences between physical and digital ownership. Like what, uh, what what's different here, uh, perhaps especially as we are moving more into an area uh, in, into an area where we have like AI generated art, like, you know, should AI be able to actually utilize uh, and um, most of the data that we have on the web uh, and then like create new art forms from that? Well, how does it change digital ownership? And I know that we actually already talked about this a little bit at a recent Shielded Transaction podcast that you, we had you on for, and you highlighted a lot of uh, really interesting uh, kind of like, yeah, just topics there. So perhaps you want to kick us off and then whoever wants to chime in uh, for the question, please, please go for it. Um. Yes, well, talking about AI and uh, the law next to Jason is really <laughs> is really something. So I'll keep it high level and brief, and then hand it to Jason, who will have much much more nuanced views on this. But um, you know, I think the things that really matter when you're thinking about generative AI and the law and and what's going to happen 
um, legally in the U.S. can really be divided into three categories. So the first category is sort of inputs. So, you know, what can AI actually go and use in order to learn? Um, and I think fundamentally the TLDR there is it's really important that we hold the line that being able to go and scan the web and learn, right, anything that, you know, a human could go and do, it's important to hold the line that AI is able to do that as well. Um, the second, and I think the battle that um, OpenAI is uh, having right now in, in various cases, um, the second is outputs. So if outputs are too similar to uh, other existing works, right, that's a totally separate question um, and uh, on copyright law. And that's um, a really difficult one and, and tricky. And there's, there's active lawsuits happening um, in that arena. And then the third is copyrightability. Um, is a are you know how do you deal with AI generated art and and copyrightability there? Um, I'll hand it off to Jason um, and keeping it very light, but I think those are really the three categories that um, it's important to think about when you're thinking about um, what the future of the law looks like with AI. That was a pretty good summary. Um, I think the one additional thing I would add to that is the uh, the source of the information. So uh, the systems can only learn from the data that is actually out there and the content that's out there on the web uh, and that's in digital format. Uh, and one of the things that we, you know, kind of hear from when we, you know, talk to, you know, various parties is uh, there's a distribution issue in the sense that um, a lot of the content is English written um, and then a lot of the content in the rest of the world, a lot of the knowledge is not digitized. And so that has implications for what can actually be learned from these systems. And we do our best to actually add more diversity to the mix, um, but you know, there's constraint there in terms of what's been translated from physical to digital. And that is a very, very important thing. And the rate at which that is happening is not keeping up with the rate of production uh, of digital content online. Um, I think the other thing that's uh, an important part of this is um, there should still be choice. Just because something is online, uh, we recognize, doesn't necessarily mean that people want it to be used for these purposes. And and so, you know, there are precedents here, such as robots.txt, people have talked about, should there be a no train, you know, kind of flag on, on various forms of content. And I think we're very open to figuring out what the right ecosystem balance there is in the long term. Because um, what can't happen in the long term is that these systems learn from everything that's online, then they become complete substitutes for everything that's online. Uh, and I think that that's not what we're really ultimately trying to do is we're basically trying to take these systems and have them understand language so that they can help people create new types of content, new forms of content, and also use language to have systems that can go do things out in the world. And you kind of see that with um, some of the new features that we have on ChatGPT, which include plugins, which it's a command that you give to another software application in plain English, and it's able to kind of go execute things for you out in the world. And so it's not that you know, we're trying to have a content production machine, it's really we're trying to create a digital assistant. But the first step to that is that it has to understand you as, as you know, in terms of your intentions and what you're saying uh, linguistically. Um, and I think all of that, at the end of the day, is an attempt to actually take this knowledge that's all out there uh, and turn it into a system that's able to basically um, act out in the world on behalf of people. Um, and that's, uh, that's our ultimate mission. I know we're quite into time limited, so I'll be very brief. I think the, the, the point on the global aspect and ensuring that other voices are heard, um, we've been doing a lot of consultation um, on creativity and AI, and there's a number of themes that come out of credit, consent, compensation, choice. But I think that um, we are very dominated by a kind of global north perspective, and this plays to your point, I think, Jason, about language. And I think having a global south perspective is, is so important in order that there is at least some balance in some of the debates that we're, we're having. Um, and that's the reason we've chosen at Creative Commons to have a theme for our coming summit the first week of October in Mexico City, where it will be about AI in the Commons to hear those voices. I'm going to pass to Barry, because I think being an artist organization, you've got some really interesting perspectives. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think about these issues around AI and what it's doing in the context of a larger conversation about how, like the primary concern is how can artists and creators maintain a livelihood? And there's lots of technical pressures and public, you know, like the NEA has $220 million a year for the nation, you know, it's like, there's not really a lot of public money, corporate money relation to art, there, there's problems all around. And so I think, 
with AI in particular, that's another type of pressure in that um, these models are only creative in so far as they have ingested a corpus of human creative output and labor um, and made a model of that and then have monetized that and made wealth for a certain group of people. Um, I don't, there's opportunities made on one side of that. So there will be new forms of art created with these tools, new opportunities created. But I also think we can't ignore that a lot of work went in to supporting what's going on with these tools. And we need some sort of coherent collective answer as a society on how artists and creators, um, ha uh, how their the economics around that are going to work, and how together in a context like DWeb we can think about creating a regener regenerative cultural infrastructure that really supports this class of people, which is really the engine that's powering all of these tools that we're talking about being economic drivers. And so I think if we forget about that sort of class and labor conversation, um, you know, we if you were lucky enough to go to uh, Kalani Nicole's presentation on the transfer archive. There's one example of a model um, of how um, the Filecoin based, uh, the data DAOs can be the center of this sort of set of economic relations and create some new models for um, how cultural works are shared and stored and preserved and create economic outputs for the entire ecosystem of stakeholders around it. And so there's a lot of these ideas springing up at DWeb Camp, and it's why we as Gray Area think it's important to um, have artists be a part of this conversation, not only as um, sort of entertainment, but also as having a seat at the table in talking through how these tools are built and how they support creators. Well, actually, I want to uh, double click uh, on this because uh, also I want to say if any one of you has questions, just like raise your hand. You know, we're trying to make this collaborative. Um, you know, so just like raise your hand and I'll, I'll, I'll try to get to you. Um, uh, but uh, I think we already like that. That was a really interesting point that you mentioned. Uh, I think in our AI tent, we also had this discussion of like data marketplaces where like, you know, like really creators of, uh, of data artists or, or other data really can get like, you know, at least we bought it for some of the data that they produce. So like that was an interesting uh, bit that you mentioned. And you mentioned um, the kind of like flag, like do not use bid. Do you know of any other like kind of emerging solutions to this or like, you know, emerging at least like approaches for like how to handle this particular like digital ownership? or like creation, uh, you know, in, in, in the use case of, uh, of generative AI. It's, it's totally fine if not, but like I'm just super curious. I did not know about these two and maybe there's more. There's one, I'll just mention one tool uh, by a sort of forward looking artist in this space, Holly Herndon um, and Matt Dryhurst, her collaborator uh, called Spawning, which is a, a opt out tool that makes use of some EU regulations to be able to opt out of training sets. Um, and they've also been doing a lot of interesting work on, you know, the other sort of like new opportunities side I mentioned, which is she has made a model of her own voice that is, um, use any, you know, it's a public access so anybody can use it to make new songs and there's some sort of model to be compensated in there. So there's some prototyping going on like that. couple of other ideas. So um, what another way to kind of approach this is also just to get very good at identifying AI generated works, uh, which has other uh, reasons for why you'd want to do that. Um, and uh, but I think um, part of this is also just kind of uh, having a way if you do that, then you can differentiate something that um, was created by a person, people can value that differently as something that was created, you know, by uh, AI generated uh, generative tool. Um, and uh, perhaps that's part of the answer here uh, in terms of also the authorship question in terms of whether or not you can own something, uh, you know, sort of in a very clear and unambiguous copyrighted manner if it's AI generated. And I think this is something the Copyright Office is struggling with too right now, which is just where do you draw the line in terms of enough human involvement versus, you know, something that's been completely AI generated. Um, and there is some creativity that goes into this and it, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a spectrum. You know, from somebody just writing a casual prompt to somebody spending a lot of time writing <clears throat> prompts and imagining what is the right one and going through many iterations and then taking pieces of what's generated and putting it together. And there are some amazing artists out there right now kind of doing that. Karen Cheng is one of them. Um, and uh, that might actually lead to some kind of uh, policy type answer, 
which is just if you're able to identify and distinguish between what's AI generated and what's human generated, you can assign different types of protections or rights to them. And that, that might be part of the solution as well. Um, and I think uh, there's also some technical measures. I forget his name. He's a brilliant researcher. He's on Twitter um, and uh, he's at Princeton. And one of the things that he did is he did something to his text and uh, it got crawled somehow by one of the AI generative tools out there. And because he, he has a sense of humor, it, he was able to get it to reproduce his text with cow, the word cow inserted every other word. And so there, there are actually probably some promising technical measures to kind of, you know, um, if you want to protect your work that way, to be able to do so. And this is just an evolving field. So I think, you know, it's going to take some time. But there are a lot of smart people thinking about this problem. So I think in this, this like this is such an important conversation of okay, you know, obviously creators are um, who who feel that their works have been used by um, people who are are using these AI tools um, are sort of uh, you know I, I think understandably upset. Like this is definitely like a, a piece that um, is really important that these voices are at the table. And um, I think at the same time we have this really interesting question. So like, this is really the question on inputs, right? Like what gets to get used by AI models, right? And who gets compensated for that and how, right? And that's a really important question. And I think there's two things that are really important to take into account. And, and one is fundamentally, we do not wanna lose the precedent that we've fought very hard for that machines can go and and read the web and see what's there and index it right like we these are these are precedents that were set very um very like after quite a lot of 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 battles and these are the sort of foundational pieces for why we are able to have things like google search right i mean these are really important at the same time how do we make sure that artists and others and creators are compensated without losing that precedent, right? And so the answer is not, let's get rid of that precedent and suddenly have it so that in order for anyone to, any machine to learn that they have to compensate someone for that, right? That is not a good outcome. So what we want is a way to compensate for content. Now, luckily we already do that, right? Like, like there's already things that are, you know, if you want to pay to learn a thing, right? Or you want to pay for custom content, we already do that. And so I think it's really about building the tools that make it so that you can really address those concerns without um, causing issues for the underlying and precedent, which is so important for the, for the future of the web. And, and then there's also the other artists who are using AI and their voice as well is, 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 is I think, important to hear. Um, to, and I, I agree, Marta, that there's precedents that have been set and, um, and, and, and over a long time. <laughs> um, and also the aspect that we've been kind of touching upon is copyright. And copyright is not universal. And, you know, you've got fair use in the US, you've got uh, exemptions, limitations in the EU, and you've got other systems. If only copyright, we had one rule for copyright across the world, we don't. And so that's the complexity as well, sometimes when we're having this debate. And that's why I think when we're thinking about it, we have to be quite nuanced sometimes about how we're, how we're articulating. But fundamentally, we've got the issues around consent, credit, compensation, choice on one side. The other side is how do we make sure that we don't lose the ability to build a commons of learning and creativity and knowledge? And that's something that certainly that balance, I think, has to be struck. Yeah, um, so I, I uh, totally understand the points that you've made, Marta, but I also think like maybe we're at a point where we have an opportunity to do a little bit of a reset on how we think about compensation and content on the web, right? Because at the beginning, um, you know, in web one, um, part of the impulse to get people online was to make content available and free in a way that did not compensate the creators, right? And kind of set that precedent, right? And um, I think that's part of the pressure that's been put on like creators in general, right? Like part of the origin of the web was giving their content away for free, essentially, you know? So like just a bigger picture question, like is there an opportunity for us to kind of reset and rethink that relationship with creators in the context of AI so that compensation is put a bit more forward um, in this situation. 
Um, I think it's a really great point, and I think um, I think that's I think that's exactly right, and I think that's the the idea here is sort of how do we actually make sure the creators are getting compensated? Like like what are the tools we can build? What are the things that we can the sort of tech we can create that enables creators to be compensated? And my point was just at the same time, we don't want to make it impossible for things like. Google search to exist, Google news to exist, or more importantly, the decentralized alternatives to those that are getting built, right? Um, and so I think it's, it's, it's really a matter of making sure that we address those, those issues, those, those compensation issues, while at the same time, and, and one way to address that is to just do away with all the precedent that we have about the ability to crawl the web and learn. And, and I think what I'm saying is, we don't need, like, ideally, we would not do away with all of that precedent. We would find other ways to make sure that we are maintaining that precedent and also building additional layers that enable artists to be and, and creators to, to be compensated. Yeah, I want to ask perhaps like a general question also uh, into the group, which is like, you know, what do people here actually think is different from AI generated art um, than, than human generated art? Is it the fact that it's a um, machine creating rather than a human? Um, or like what, what strikes as like the, the, the real crux point here of like how to dis differentiate it? Is it mostly really the compensation model uh, or like uh, what, what is it that, you know, that you think is like, um, yeah, distinctively different here? Anyone can answer this? Or can I can start. Um, I would say that, so AI generated, uh, so there's a difference between using AI as a tool to generate art and talking about AI generating art as own, which isn't a question that makes any sense. At all. You know, it just, you know, AI is a multi-dimensional statistical model trained on the corpus of human creation and a art, human artist is a person with a life experience and like joys and fears and desires and beliefs and like needs to eat and things, you know? So like in some way the question doesn't, you know, but, um, in terms of AI, like how can, what does the artist add and what can AI do? Um, <clears throat> humans add context and that's a thing that AI like fundamentally can't have because it can only know what's within the, the training set, can't know outside of that like by definition. And so it takes a person to come in and use those tools in a way that has a certain effect. And that effect and context is the artistic act. And so that's the, there's a holistic sort of gesture and act that happens there that has to take some sort of intent into account. And that's why it can't just be like an automated gesture. So there's a tiny answer to that. Of hands. Who here uh, would have considered themselves an artist before, like all of the AI-generated uh, uh, stuff came came along? Uh, who here has used uh, AI to generate uh, art afterwards? Um, and yeah, for those of you who raised your hands twice, like, what do you think really is uh, is different here? Like, uh, I think it would be really interesting to to just hear, uh, in case you in, uh, you already have the microphone, go for it. Yeah. So for me, during like game design and stuff, the AI has definitely with certain projects helped me iterate a lot faster for concept design or like generative tools have been something game designers have wanted for years and it's finally very accessible to use those tools that used to only be in a few pieces of software and would only have one or two small use cases in the process but now it can be used for almost every aspect of game design and stuff like that. Um, but I also love creating my own art and stuff. But yeah, I definitely think it's a very useful tool for um, uh, doing a lot of stuff. And I I worry, though, about like the stuff I see on like some of my artist friends who freak out over it when... They don't know whether it's training on their stuff or whether how long it will be till a AI can literally rip off a game. Like there's a lot of coding tools that are being trained on game code that are really dang good already. And like it's great for coding, but also it makes it very easy to rip off games much easier, which... People can put millions of hours into 
creating game and we're getting to the point where almost every aspect of that game can be copied by different sets of AIs and thrown together in a few weeks or a month. Um, and that will hurt to a degree, but I think a lot of these tools are still at this stage where a lot of the answers can be put into the system. I have a comment I'll say in a minute, but I want to let other people answer. <laughs> Yeah, I'll just say, just to be clear on something, I mean, we aren't against it. You know, Gray Area ran the first um, generative adversarial network uh, show and auction in 2016 with Google Deep Dream. Um, and so we've been sort of like in this space for a while. And the sort of other point is um, that I don't think that this is an exclusively a, a technical solution in all of these things. I think these conversations are part of sort of a larger societal, multi-stakeholder conversation about how do we value and how do we create sustainable livelihoods for artists and creators to participate. And so part of that might be some technical things in DWeb to do payments and things like that. It's interesting because crypto, and insofar as that's, you know, connect DWeb project, a subset of the DWeb project, um, and AI are the first two technology trends, let's say paradigms, that um, the art world took seriously, really. Um, and they're the first two where artists and creators are really the leading use cases, like driving in the market those technologies forward. And so it's it's these are the first two places where the companies generally understand that artists and creators are vital to the to their interests in the success of these tools they don't understand fully that that artistic thinking and labor and creativity has value that should be compensated beyond access to the api free for a bunch of artists um you know even you know there are artists here in this camp that's great payment is inconsistent you know how that works and and artists are a very different class than um technologists that have other means to support themselves. And so it's not any one of these things. It's like we have to, as a society, say like, do we value this? If so, there's a lot of different ways that everybody in their companies or lives or things can like, you know, and part of that is in the tools we build. Part of that is in social relations and economic relations in the company and who you bring in and who you bring into the company, all this sort of stuff, so. Almost a time, but I would hate to let you guys go without sharing at least like, you know, a nudge of like, where is this all going and what can people do to buckle up? Uh, maybe we start over there uh, and then we move down uh, here. Um, sure. I, look, I think fundamentally um, a lot of the moral panic around AI feels a lot like the moral panic around photography or right and a lot of the conversations that you have around like authorship right there was a supreme court case about can someone copyright a photograph because they aren't the artist like and there was and the supreme court had to consider that question right so i think these are not actually new battles these are just the same battles new tools great wonderful um so i think one one thing i kind of before i answer this question is uh i want to talk a little bit about how the systems work um, in the sense of the relationship to the training data, because I think this is kind of very related to the question of compensation for the training data. And I'm just gonna actually uh, convey a, an analogy that our chief scientist, Elliot Suskiver, talks about as to why he thinks these systems work. Uh, and the honest answer is actually, we're still trying to understand how these systems work in terms of you know why, why they're able to do what they do from the training data. And it's not that there are remixes or collages um, although I understand why that's the analogy you first go to if you think about all the stuff that goes in and then something comes out on the other end. But the analogy that he has is imagine uh, like a murder mystery novel um, and the villain is not revealed until the very last word. Uh, you have an entire story, a lot of text, a lot of information. You don't know who the villain is. Uh, and the, uh, the basic algorithm of training is just predict the next word based on understanding what's come before it. Um, and the last word is the thing that's predicted is the identity of the villain. You can't predict that without actually having learned from everything that came before, and it's actually not a repetition of everything that came before. And so there's something happening there. We're still trying to understand it, um, but I think that's one of the things 
to also think about is, you know, to Marta's point, is that we have these systems, we have these technologies, they're taking knowledge and they're trying to create, help you create new knowledge from them. Um, and that's not to, you know, try to deflect from the very valid concerns about livelihoods and, you know, creative authenticity. Totally recognize all that. Just one of the things um, just trying to kind of clarify is it's not just taking the training data and spinning, sp uh, spitting it back out. Um, there's an additional kind of process there, which may be not the same as how human beings learn, but seems to be from the output and input perspective, um, somewhat similar in that you're not always getting the same thing coming out on the other end. Um, but also we recognize if you do get the same thing coming out on the other end, that's a problem. I'll be, I'll be really brief. So what do we know? We know there's going to be an EU AI Act that's in negotiation at the moment. We know there's going to be some court cases in the US which are going to set precedents. But I think moreover, we're going to be using these tools. We're going to be experimenting. And more and more of us are looking at that and, and actually are creating in ways that we never thought were imaginable. So I do think there will be issues around compensation, opt-outs, all of that. But I think that as we move forward, who knows where things will go? Uh. I don't know if I have any good wrap up. I would I would say um, uh, to that point, I think yes, that's true, and it's dangerous to be technically reductionist because there's an effect to this stuff that's real, which is the thing doesn't work without the training data. People made that training data. It spits out something that looks a lot like that in the collage, and like that's the way it is, you know, it's kind of like saying, oh, why do, you know, it's like musicologists, they're like, oh, why do we love music so much? And they start thinking, well, they're endorphins, and, the, you know, it's like, you can't compose that way. You know, there's levels of abstraction here that are real, and you have to think about the effect of these tools in the context of the real world, real material labor conditions. You know, we didn't even get, the, the last point, I know we gotta get out of here, is like, there's things like, there's a real material aspect to this, like access to compute, you know, like uh, environmental, like all this stuff is, tr you know, in this conversation, it's like, do we defend Taiwan because we need the chips so much? Because we're, there's like, there's a whole set of relations here that need to be thought about, like when we think about how we ethically judge what we're up to here. And like, you know, my little piece of that is thinking about how artists can be a part of that because I think it's, we believe it's important. So that's, I guess that's it. Thanks so much for making us go over. My German heart is crying, but I think it was worth it. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you. This was really wonderful. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining for your great questions.